So in this episode, we're going to talk about prisons and consecration, not forced equality. Here we go. Okay, in this episode, we're going to go through Acts chapters 3, 4, and 5. And in chapter 3, we start off with Peter and John. And they're going to go and, as we said previously, as much as things change, things stay the same. And here, Peter and John are going to the temple to teach. They're going at evening prayers, which is at 3 p.m. There would be a number of people there at that time that would be gathered together publicly, probably others that are teaching there in the large outside of the temple walls and outside of the uh, the courts there in the temple and here they come across a man who is lame since he was born and it sounds like he's been put there at the gate day after day after day and the gate that he's put at here is called the gate of the temple is called beautiful we don't know of any other gates that are called beautiful historically where the actual name is beautiful, but we might have an idea of what gate this is. I'm going to go over that in just a minute. And so Peter and John walk by this man, and he was probably there during the times that they arrived at the temple with Jesus. But he's he's there, and and Peter looks over at him. He says here in verse 3, and the man looks over at Peter and John, hoping to get some alms, some, some money or something to help him out. But this is what Peter does. It says here in verse 4, And Peter, fastening his eyes upon him with John, said, Look on us. Now we're going to try and go through here a little bit and see if Luke is trying to give us a little message of what's going on here, a little parallelism. First of all, he's saying, Look. Right? Look on us. So he looks over and he says, Just look on us. And the man, and he gave heed unto them, expecting to receive something of them. Then Peter says, Silver and gold have I none, but such as I have, give I thee. And then he says, In the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, rise up and walk. Rise up and walk. So we're going to see some trigger words here, if you will. Going through here, we saw look. And now we see rise up here. And he took him by the right hand and lifted him up. And immediately his feet and ankle bones received strength. And he leaping up stood and walked and entered with them into the temple, walking and leaping and praising God. The man probably was not previously allowed in because of his disability or whatever the problem was that he had here. So this is probably the first time he's able to go in to the courts of the temple even. So if we look at this scenario here, we can look at a little bit of parallelism. Something I think is happening here. We want to look oftentimes in the Book of Mormon and in, well, in all of the Scripture to refer back to many things that happened during the Exodus. And... We've brought this up several times before, even with the woman, the adulteress, with Jesus at, at, here at the temple. But we have words here that would possibly move our minds to the brazen serpent that was lifted up in the desert again. Here's how I see this. Peter says to the lame man, look on us. Just like someone who needs to be healed in the wilderness, who's been bitten by one of the venomous snakes would need to look to the brazen serpent to be healed. And he says, look upon us. And then he says something interesting here that you might not pick up. But he says, then Peter said, silver and gold have I none, but such as I have I give thee. So he doesn't have silver or gold. So what does he have? He says he's going to give him something. What does he have? Well, what he has is the authority of the name of Jesus Christ. He has the priesthood. And so he says, in the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, rise up and walk. So he doesn't have silver and gold, but he has the name of Jesus Christ and that authority. Well, the gate beautiful is likely 
the Nicorin Gate, I'm not sure exactly how to pronounce that, or, or the Gate of Corinth, as they would call it. And oddly enough, this gate is one of few that is not lay, overlaid with gold and with silver, but it's overlaid with bronze. So here Peter says, I don't have gold or silver. I'm here at the, the beautiful gate, the bronze gate. I don't have the gold or the silver that we would find at all the other gates. That's not what's here. But here we have the, the, the brazen gate, if you will, the bronze gate. And he says, but what I do have is the name of Jesus Christ. That is just like the brazen serpent, the bronzed serpent, the brass serpent that was lifted up in the wilderness. And then he says to him afterward, and he lifted him up, right? So again, raising up or lifting up is a term that is oftentimes associated closely in scriptures with the brazen serpent. And of course, the man is healed, not with the gold or silver that's anywhere else, but with the brazen serpent, with the name of Jesus Christ. I find that pretty interesting. I don't know what scholarly backing there is to that, but that's how I read that. That's what it looks like to me. So then the people there in the courts of the temple are amazed at what has happened. They know who this is. This man has been lame since birth, and here he's been healed in the name of Jesus Christ. And so Peter says to those individuals around him, he says, the God of Abraham and of Isaac and of Jacob, the God of our fathers, hath glorified his son Jesus, whom ye delivered up and denied in the presence of Pilate when he was determined to let him go. We're going back to that Day of Atonement scenario. Remember where G Pilate presents Jesus as the pure goat but he is the one that ends up being sacrificed, and it is the one that has the sins that is let go. It's Barabbas that is let go. In verse 14, But ye denied the Holy One and the just, and desired a murderer to be granted unto you, Barabbas, and killed the Prince of Life, whom God hath raised from the dead, whereof we are witnesses. So he's going back and indicting several of these individuals that are there at the temple that would have been part of that mob or those in charge that chose to have Jesus sacrificed, have him crucified. And then he says to these individuals, repent. He's going to send Jesus Christ, repent. Accept that Jesus is the Christ, that he is the Son of God, and that he is the prophet that Moses had spoken about that would be coming. And he continues with a the theme of lifting up or raising up. He says here in verse 22, For Moses truly said unto the fathers, A prophet shall the Lord your God raise up unto you of your brethren, like unto me. Him shall ye hear in all things whatsoever he shall say unto you. And then he comes back again, and this is crucial to understand. And he says in the following verse, All the prophets from Samuel and those that follow after, of course, we know all of the prophets from the time of Adam have said this. But those that follow after, as many as have spoken, have likewise foretold of these days. So this is something that has always been given as a truth, as a prophecy, as the prophecy in the church with the people here, with Jerusalem, with the covenant people. And yet it had been corrupted. The idea of what was going to happen had been corrupted. The pure truth of the most important event and the most important person in mankind had been corrupted, of course. And Peter and John are speaking to the priests. They're talking to the captain of the temple who would, be, would have been in charge of all the sacrifices and the rituals and the personnel there. And then the Sadducees coming upon them. And the Sadducees were the ones that were overall in charge of the temple and the priesthood. The high priests are Sadducees. Annas and Caiaphas, these are all Sadducees. And one of their false doctrines is that they do not believe in the resurrection. And so Peter and John start to preach about the resurrection. And so this is a soft spot for them. This is a sore spot. They're not real happy about this. And so they lay their hands on Peter and John. They take him, put him into prison, into jail, and hang on to him. But Peter and John 
are able to deliver truths that ring true to people. They're not educated. They're Galileans. They're something, again, like from Pentecost that people could recognize. These are poor people. They're uneducated. They're unsophisticated. They are not from the academy. They are not from the university system. They're not coming out of Alexandria. They're certainly not from Harvard and Yale and all these other places. These are low-level, low-educated, poor fishermen, or at least unsophisticated, that are speaking with power and authority and convincing sophisticated people and those at the temple, those that are listening to them, that Jesus was and is the Christ and that these, this fullness of the gospel has been brought to them and that the resurrection is a true doctrine. It says right after this in verse 4, Howbeit many of them which heard the word believed, and the number of the men was about 5,000. So we can imagine this, go back to even the time at the beginning of the church with Joseph Smith, another unlearned Galilean, if you will. Unsophisticated, unlearned, had to teach himself most everything or find those that would help teach him. And yet he spoke with power and authority. He was a witness and he could speak truth. And so 5,000 people here are converted from these teachings at this time from Peter and John and, of course, from the miracle of the lame man being healed. And so then the following day as they're in prison, then the high priests and the elders and the scribes all come as well. And they hold maybe a little bit of a, a council here, a Sanhedrin, or a mini Sanhedrin, a partial Sanhedrin perhaps. They're not happy with what's going on here. They're not happy that Peter and John are providing miracles and teachings about this Jesus who they thought they had gotten rid of. And so they ask Peter and John, by what power or by what name have ye done this? And Peter, filled with the Holy Ghost, said unto them, Ye rulers of the people and elders of Israel, if we this day be examined of the good deed done to the impotent man, by what means he is made whole, be it known unto you all and to all the people of Israel that by the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, whom ye crucified, whom God raised from the dead, even by him doth this man stand here before you whole. That's pretty powerful. So you got rid of this man. Well, we are working in his name. And he resurrected from the dead, from the tomb that you sent your servants to, to guard. He escaped the tomb as the stone was rolled away, and he was resurrected. And the man you killed, it's by his power that this lame man here stands here whole. And then Peter goes into something pretty interesting. This chapter has somewhat of a, uh, a theme of Psalm 118. And Psalm 118 is a messianic psalm. And it has themes of salvation, of the Messiah. Uh, this verse here in 11, this is the stone which was set at naught of you builders, which has become the head of the corner. In other words, you ignored Jesus completely and pulled him away from the building here of, of, the, of the church, of the temple, of the priesthood. And yet he is the head of the corner. He is the cornerstone. That comes from Psalm 118. And then he says with the theme of salvation, neither is there salvation in any other. In Psalm 118, you get a lot of lines in there about the name of the Lord and about salvation coming through the name of the Lord. So he's saying through the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, we are performing these miracles. He is the Messiah of Psalm 118. And we're doing this in the Lord's name, in his name. He's the Lord. He is Jehovah. And then here in verse 13, just like it would have been with those around Joseph Smith, Luke says to us in verse 13, Now when they saw the boldness of Peter and John and perceived that they were unlearned and ignorant men, they marveled and they took knowledge of them that they had been with Jesus. So this is not common for them, right? This is not... How does someone speak like this if they have not been educated 
in the right circles? How do they have these truths, this ability to argue these points, and this authority? And I find it very interesting that the council here that is judging them are using education as a figure of authority as compared to the authority of Jesus Christ that they are doing this with. They're saying they're marveling that they're able to do anything or say these things because they don't have the authority of an education. And that's contrasted with the true authority that they have, which comes through Jesus Christ. And so they finally say, fine, you guys can go, but don't preach or heal in the name of Jesus Christ anymore. We forbid you to do that. And so they let him go. And so they go back to, Peter and John go back to their own, the church, to members of the church, and to their own company, it says. And they tell them what had happened, and there, are, there is some shaking of the earth that happens as they speak, and they're, they're filled with the Holy Ghost as they recount the preaching and the miracles that have, have just occurred. And then we get something interesting here that Luke inserts. In verse 32, he says, And the multitude of them, this is the church, that believed were of one heart and of one soul or one mind. That's Zion. Now, we've gone over this before about the progression through the four phases of the priesthood. And that highest phase, the fourth phase, is the one I call Zion. And that's what is being stated here by Luke, I believe. He's talking about, he's showing that the fullness of the priesthood is in place. And even though Jesus is gone, the church has the fullness of the priesthood. And so he's going, he's talking about Zion. And immediately after that, he gives the number one attribute, besides saying they're of one heart, he gives the number one attribute of Zion. And he says, Neither said any of them that aught of the things which he possessed was his own, but they had all things in common. So the law of consecration, that is the f- biggest attribute of the fourth phase of the priesthood, the highest phase of the Melchizedek priesthood. And Luke wants us to know that the fullness of the gospel is restored here with the church. And he finishes off this with a little bit of a comparison. This end of verse of chapter 4 here runs into chapter 5, but it says in verse 36, And Joseph, who by the apostles was surnamed Barnabas, don't confuse him with Barabbas. Barabbas is the one that was also going to be crucified, but was let go by the people. This is Barnabas. And Barnabas, having land, in verse 37, sold it and brought the money and laid it at the apostles' feet. So he was a good disciple. He, he sold his land, he brought the money, and he, he put it at the disciples' feet. That's the positive example. Going over to chapter 5, then, we get the negative adva- example and the, the contrast with Barnabas and with Ananias and Sapphira. And Ananias and Sapphira here in chapter 5, they go and they sell assets and they bring money and they give it to the disciples, but they have held some of it back. And this was a no-no, apparently, because both Ananias and Sapphira are both, both die. They're struck dead by God, according to this chapter. Now, what does that actually mean? Can you imagine that happening today? Because... I don't know, because you went and you you paid 9% instead of 10% of your tithing. I think there's a point that's being made here. I don't know. I'm tr- not, I, I try really hard with these things not to be a Monday morning historian because it's really easy to do. But I wonder if this is exactly how this happened. Regardless, it is a comparison that is being made between Barnabas giving everything, Barnabas giving everything, and Ananias and Sapphira holding back from God and dying because of it. So the message is, obviously, that you should give your all. And if you're in the law of consecration, you should be giving all to the Lord. I don't know that the consequences are always going to be the same. 
but the message is given here to fulfill the law of consecration. Now, another thing about this that's interesting is that we never hear again after this, after this period here, about the law of consecration. You don't see it in the letters of Paul. You don't see it in the book of Revelation. You don't see this anymore in the New Testament. It's as if it's gone, as if you, you, we even have references to um, funds that are being put together, like, like a, a welfare fund for people, instead of the law of consecration. So it seems to have not worked. And we know how that is, right? We know the Israelites with Moses could not handle even the Melchizedek law at all. We know that with Joseph Smith, as we tried to implement the law of consecration, things didn't work out very well and it was withdrawn, it was pulled back. Now there's still the spirit of that. We still commit to that, but actual practice of that is not in place. And it looks to me like it may not have worked out very well for the early saints here either. It's a tough deal. I do want to make a comment about the difference between the law of consecration and socialism or Marxism, communism. And this is, I think, a very important point because we hear this oftentimes that either inside or outside of the church, just either questioning or actually trying to argue for some type of Marxism, that, well, the Christians taught it and they practiced it. Or inside of our own church, well, wait a minute, don't we believe in the law of consecration? How is that different from communism and Marxism? It's a massive difference, massive difference. And what the difference is, is actually going through those four phases of the priesthood. And that is, is that the law of consecration, first and foremost, is going to go to the first step in the Aaronic priesthood, which is individuality and agency. You can never get rid of that. Once you pull individuality away, then you, are, you have pulled away the law of consecration. It's not consecrated anymore. Once you take things by force, then you are taking away the gift, you're taking away the ability to give, and you're taking away the meaning of the gift. You're taking away agency. And so where the state runs everything and the state owns these things and assets to begin with, then there is no law of consecration happening. You never have it in the first place. And it's done by force. So if you go back to the preexistence and in the book of Revelation, and you see references to the war in heaven, to me it's very similar to this. You have one side that is accepting the plan of Jesus Christ which is based on struggle and merit and works and repentance and grace. Right? You have to have all of those things in place. But you're going to be responsible for your works. You're going to be responsible to grow and to progress and to reach out to God. It's not all grace. You have to have the ability to repent and to try to follow the example of the Savior. Whereas the other side was saying, well, wait a minute, that's not fair. We don't want to have to go through that. We want everyone forced to be equal, an equality that is forced. And what that does is it removes the ability to progress for anyone automatically. And it gives the glory or we can say the power to the state, or in the case of the preexistence, the power to Lucifer. Give me the glory, he said. And the way they fought that is accusations. And we can see the same thing today from either side of the aisle when you're looking at a collective that is trying to make someone part of just a group, a, co a collective mentality which removes your individuality and removes your agency. That's how I see it. And so Marxist communism on one side, law of consecration on the other, it all has to do with the individual. And if you remove that out of the equation, then you've got somebody else's plan completely. 
And so then the apostles continue to teach in the name of Jesus Christ, despite being told not to. They continue to heal. And you have people that are lining up around where Peter was walking just so they could get into his shadow, hoping that they could be healed by Peter. So Peter especially is becoming this new figure, this new healer like Christ as he goes around preaching and healing in the name of Jesus Christ. And they're adding multitudes, we're told, of new converts. And, of course, someone's not happy about this, or some people are not very happy about it. And, of course, some people are not very happy about this. And so as these miracles are performed, just like in the time of Jesus, when the miracles are performed and these teachings are put out there, you are basically kicking the hornet's nest is what's happening. And so the Sadducees, which is the sect of the, of the high priests, are furious. And so they again take Peter, and so they again take the apostles and put them into a prison. And the Lord comes at night, the angel of the Lord comes at night and opens the door, and they miraculously are let out of the prison. Now, thinking about this, this is the second time just in this episode that they've been put in prison and are released. We Again, we see the same thing with Joseph Smith. This is a pattern. This is how truth works. This is how goodness works. It starts off small and grows and is beaten down from all sides of a mortal world. Mortal rules, mortal establishment, they don't like it. They want to fight against it. They want to extinguish this goodness. And so Joseph Smith was put into jail and accused of everything you can think of under the sun legally. He was tarred and feathered. He was beat. And he was put into prison over and over again. And here the, the angel of the Lord lets them out of prison. Actually, something I'm kind of proud of, my great, great, great grandfather was one of the men that helped Joseph Smith escape from Liberty Jail. Pretty cool. Pretty cool. And so the angel tells them to go to the temple and teach again. Go back and keep teaching. And so you can imagine there are multitudes of people. Remember, these temple courts were massive, huge. They could hold thousands and thousands of people. And so they go back there and they keep teaching. And so the high priests go back, send the people, the captain with the guard, back to get the apostles from the prison and they're gone. And so they find out that they're at the, at the temple. They send the guard there to go get them and to bring them back. But not until, again, they have converted many, many more people here at the temple. And so you can imagine what's going on in the high priests, the Sadducees, the elders, the scribes, the Pharisees, all their minds, what's going on here. They thought they had gotten rid of this problem when they killed Jesus Christ. But now those that are acting in his name are continuing on and are doing the same works that Jesus did, just as Jesus said that they would. And they brought the apostles back to see them, but without violence. Why without violence? Because they're afraid of the people. It's just like when Jesus was there. Remember, there are thousands of disciples, probably at this point tens and tens of thousands of converts to Christianity, which really for them, they're not describing themselves as Christians. They're just describing themselves as we have the fullness of the gospel back. They're still Jews. They're still Jews, and they're probably still following through on practicing most everything, except for maybe sacrifices. But they are a new sect of Jews that are emerging. And here, as the high priests say, they are filling Jerusalem with their doctrine. But just like when Jesus was crucified, there were probably tens of thousands of followers, perhaps, that were there during Passover, that were the ones laying out the branches for the procession coming into Jerusalem 
and that were listening to him and his teachings there in his last week of life. So we only hear about a few of the apostles and a few of the other leaders of Christianity early on, but this is a large, large group at this point. And the Jews that are in power are not very happy about this at all. Peter responds to them saying, yes, we're still teaching, we're still healing in the name of the Savior, in the name of Jesus Christ, and he refers back again to Psalm 118 and some of the, the, the scriptures that are there as Luke continues with this theme of Psalm 118. You might want to go back and read that chapter of Psalm 118 and then look at chapters 4 and 5 of Acts. And so they're taking counsel together. This is like the Sanhedrin, or at least a part of it. And what they decide to do is to kill him, just like they were going to, just like they did with Jesus, because they don't know what else to do. But one among them, whose name is Gamaliel, who happens to be actually the, I think he's the teacher of Paul. So Gamaliel is a, is a doctor of the law and he's a Pharisee. And he says that he commanded to put the apostles forth a little space and said unto them, Ye men of Israel, take heed to yourselves what ye intend to do as touching these men. And he basically says, look, they'll talk a little bit and then things will fizzle away. If we kill them now, he's probably saying we're going to make new martyrs just like we did of Jesus Christ. And that obviously didn't work. So let's just let them go and things will settle down. Is kind of what he's, he's putting out there. And so... They call the apostles back in and they beat them. They're thugs, basically. And they command that they should not speak in the name of Jesus and let them go. So they again say, stop this. And then it says something kind of interesting here in verse 41. They say, and they departed from the presence of the council, the apostles, rejoicing that they were counted worthy to suffer shame for his name. So that's kind of interesting. They, they are joyful. They're happy that they were able to suffer. Isn't that interesting? Would you be joyful to suffer for the name of Jesus Christ? It reminds me of Lehi's vision. Remember, as they, those that get up to the tree of life, which is a representation of the Savior, and they partake of the fruit, and then they look across the way there and there is the, just like we have the JSB at BYU, it's the GSB, right? The great and spacious building. And those inside are, are throwing shame out at those that are at the tree and making them suffer. And they're saying they're grateful to be in that position, that they can take that on because they know that's how it works. They know that in order for goodness to succeed, they have to go through this to be able to overthrow it, to be able to overcome it. And so to them, they count it as victory. They count it as maybe taking on a small amount of what the Savior took on. And then, of course, lastly again, just like we ended the last episode, in verse 42, And daily in the temple... And in every house, they ceased not to teach and preach Jesus Christ. So the Sadducees telling them to stop teaching in the name of, of Jesus didn't really work too well. And they continue to do so in the temple, especially. I'll talk to you next time. <music>